The views and opinions expressed by participants within this film are entirely their own and do not represent the views of Manchester Metropolitan University, the Union, or Spectrum Media. The UK triggered Article 50 on the 29th of March and I think the easiest analogy for this is a divorce. So the triggering of Article 50 is basically saying we want a divorce. Well at 20 minutes to 5 we can now say the decision taken in 1975 by this country to join the common market has been reversed by this referendum. It is a historic moment. We've been through extraordinary turmoil here in Britain over the last few weeks. The Article 50 process is now underway, and in accordance with the wishes of the British people, the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union. Donald Trump wins the presidency. I will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. Young voter turnout in the UK is at a 50-year low and falling. I don't really feel as much point. 2.4 million young people are missing from Britain's electoral register. It's time to step up. It's the morning of June 24th, 2016. If you're in London, it's sunny. If you're in Manchester, it's typically drizzly. Maybe you've slept, maybe you haven't. The result of the EU referendum is in. Britain has decided to leave. How do you feel? How does your grandma feel? What's going through your mind? Has democracy served you well this time around? Disappointing all around. I was pretty happy, you know? I not really sunk in yet. I would need to see, like, see if they actually implement what they're going to say. I felt... Discriminated. We've stepped into the unknown. Sobering. Yeah. I wanted Brexit to happen. <sighs> I was gutted. I, um, I stayed up as long as I could. I think I knew that it was going to happen around four or five o'clock in the morning, whenever it was, and I went to bed because I knew it was inevitable. I was woken up at 6am because I had fallen asleep on the sofa, staying up to watch the results. Uh, and I ran to the staff lounge at like 6am, which meant it was 11am here, so obviously and results had been announced all over the country. I had eaten a whole jar of Ben and & Jerry's. And then the next day, everyone snapchatted it, everyone was so gutted, it was uh, open the news, and it said we've left, um, and then, like, I don't know why, but I just felt so upset. Yeah, I cried. It's, um, I... Honestly, like, there's an only word to describe it. It's heartbroken. But the BBC headline, Cameron quits as um, Britain votes to leave the EU, and it, and it was brilliant, you know. I had, a, I had a fantastic moment. I think it was like one minute where I, I just couldn't stop dancing. I don't want to talk about work too much, but last year, me and the five other officers worked for eight, nine months on the EU campaign and going out to students and talking about why it's so important and why they should vote. And our stance was that we should remain because of all the opportunities it gives young people and for the voter turnout for students in that age category to be low you kind of feel a sense of responsibility of we didn't do enough to inform students. I think the day before there was a big anticipation that we were going to remain so I thought you know we were going to remain I thought it wasn't, wasn't that deep. If I'm going to be honest I always thought we were going to vote to remain. I always thought we were going to vote to remain because I thought the, um, the campaign tactics and, uh, and the stuff that the Remain campaign was saying about how much money we'd lose and what we'd not be able to do and what we would be able to do, it just seemed uh, unlikely. So uh, f for me, uh, definitely personally, I think it will. Uh, I think we'll have more opportunities. Uh, I felt yeah, upset, of course. Um, partly a bit annoyed. Partly I couldn't. Bother. I mean, I'm not British, I didn't vote. Like, at the end, I was like, if that's what makes you happy, then you have to go for it as a country if the majority votes for it. Although the majority was not high, like, it was not a big majority. But still, if that's what people feel is best for them, fair enough. I mean, that's what votes are for. Partly, maybe it was a bit misinformed, or so one could say. There was a lot of prejudice in a way, and like the campaign think they didn't offer so many solutions, they just were annoyed with how the state of the UK and the EU is, but 
they lack actually providing solutions, which is dangerous. I mean, I'm not saying that the state is great or so. I mean, there is maybe problems in the EU and yeah, definitely not everything is great. But as a politician, I think you have also the responsibility to provide solutions like how to change in the future and not just say everything is bad and therefore we have to leave. In the short term, um, nothing is really going to change. We are still going to be a member state of the European Union. Um, we will know more uh, towards the end of April when the 27 member states of the European Union have decide uh, their negotiating position and really these negotiations aren't going to really get started probably until autumn 2017. This is the most negative campaign I have ever seen is the EU. It, both sides weren't talking about why we should vote for them because they're positives, it was why should you vote for them because the other side are wrong. Any plan is better than no plan, is the saying, right? So, and sometimes it feels like there was no plan and when you see how UKIP developed after that Nigel Farage left the party, different leaders of the party and so on, it seems there was never a real plan like how to address many issues, which is dangerous and which could be problematic for the UK. I think it's a vibe that politics in itself has, whereby a lot of young people see politicians and people just go on and nothing actually happens in politics. It's all a lot of bollocks where a lot of things get said and nothing happens. Whereby people probably will think, or students think, yeah, if I voted, if I said this, would it actually change anything? I'd like to say, yeah, but to the majority, be like, yeah, this has happened, people have said this, people have done this, people have shouted about this, but nothing's happened. So what is what is there to say that things will change now? I think prior to that there wasn't really any knowledge of what Brexit was, like broad knowledge. I think people just saw Brexit as, oh now we're going to really cut down and kind of tackle immigration really really hard. I think primarily looking at that there wasn't really a broader scope of what it would incorporate and what it really meant, especially for young people. Um, the way I felt I didn't really feel, I felt, I felt a bit numb. We've never been a very kind of pro-EU, European integration kind of member state the UK has. It's always been a reluctant partner, an awkward partner, that's what it's going to us. So as a consequence, people don't really know. Um, so I think now, kind of actually talking about it is the best thing that you could possibly do and trying to find out more information about it. Us sitting here talking about these issues rather than like sitting in our own countries and kind of like saying oh these guys over there and that guy's over there kind of so it's, it's nice to meet and talk and, and, and build friendships and then all these friendships they, they bond and I have many friends now in England and around the world and I don't want to have any conflict with their nationality or where they come from or so and, and I, I also noticed all these stereotypes are also actually often not valid or so so just by engaging with each other you actually realize that you have much more in common and that, you, that, that living together and working together is much better than against each other. I'll say it, my grandma. My grandma voted out. The rest of the family pretty much voted remain. My dad actually voted to leave. My grandma told me and my mum and dad that she would vote the way that we did because it's not going to affect her because touch wood it doesn't happen any time soon but she's not going to be here. So we fell out slightly but obviously I'm not going to fall out with my family. I don't want to fall out with my family over something like a vote. I just don't think that's... Because at the end of the day, yeah, I wish my dad had vote for me but it wouldn't have changed necessarily the whole outcome. And then when I found out that she voted out, I was fuming. I, I, I lost my rag because I was like, you known for the last year that my whole job has been working on this and working on creating opportunities for young people and she's just cancelled out my vote. So what was the point? If your own family don't back you, and you, own, and you can't get through to your own family, then you can appreciate how hard it is to get in, get in the hearts of 38,000 people. I think, with, especially with Trump and with the EU referendum, it was a matter of people thinking that they've been given a licence to kill. When I say a licence to kill, it's up to kill people's feelings, people's emotions, what people think, what rights people have, to actually kill that aspect of we're both citizens with equal rights, whereby because you think you're from a particular background or you voted a particular way, it gives you more of a right to actually lessen what rights I have, what opinion I have, whereby it's not important what I think anymore because we as a country have voted for something against, against me or against what I think, against who I am. There's been an increase in sort of like discrimination and prejudice and racism and I feel like now it's very obvious, like I feel like set parts of the media or you know um, set people don't even hide it anymore and um, it's quite open you know what their beliefs are and what they 
uh, what you know political group they go into. Yeah, well, you you ask yourself if you're still welcome in this country and if you if you should stay or if you should even make a statement and maybe leave yourself, kind of saying, okay, if you if you don't want me or other immigrants, you know, uh, it's it makes you think about and also maybe the but also about the uh, yeah, opportunities you had in the past and like the prior no, the the privileges uh, as a as an EU citizen which are maybe taken away soon. But as I said also that they are taken away from the British citizens as well. Maybe they're not away aware of this that they will not have so many privileges afterwards. And I think that's something that we really need to to make sure of um, going forward, you know, between now and leaving is that, you know, EU nationals you know, are more than welcome here in the UK, and um, that they shouldn't feel unwanted or unwelcome or, or worried about the future. And this is why I think as negotiations go forward, one of the kind of key issues to pin down, so to speak, will be the status of, of EU nationals. But equally, you know, there's many, you know, UK citizens living abroad who think, well, are we going to ma be made feel welcome? It's a two-way street. And as a consequence of that two-way street, um, I think we'll get to see um, a bit more of a compromise, perhaps, than we first anticipated or we first thought um, from kind of the negotiation process. Over the last 12 months, there's been profound changes to the political landscape in the West. The decision to leave the European Union, the resurgence of populist movements, the election of Donald Trump. Each development has brought either joy or anger. No more is this apparent than in the university campuses, where the future generations are competing for their voices to be heard. Oh, wavy haired crumpet. Well, Waste of time. Hated by all. Powerful. Sexist. Unfortunate looking. Don't like him. A big concern. Scary. Misogynistic. Racist asshole. Whoa! Absolute idiot. Bigoted. A terrorist. <laughs> I hate Trump. I don't know. I don't care about him. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Well, I think we, we've had some quite interesting debates in the class in particular in relation to leadership and in terms of the styles of leadership that we're now seeing um, in relation to Donald Trump and in relation to people such as Theresa May. You know, we are seeing a complete shift in terms of the sort of, um, particularly, you know, what we see from Donald Trump and uh, this very much... Uh, quite uh, dictat dictatorial type styles of leadership which is quite concerning really in this um, the whole ethos that's been coming through is quite uh, quite worrying really yeah terrifying absolutely terrifying he's normalizing sexism completely and that should not be happening we should be progressing and he is a massive step back for the movement of white society it's sort of like he is rape culture personified and it's terrifying. So the the, the, the protest in Manchester, yeah. what do you think about that? I agree, it is great, but it wasn't just happening in Manchester, it was a the Manchester one was a sister march to marches across the world really. Literally, what's Doris from Withington gonna be able to do to stop President Trump being elected? It is literally the most pointless protest these people have ever had. These people who are campaign these people who are complaining, not campaigning, complaining, because Donald Trump's just been elected president in a country three thousand miles away. What effect is President Trump and Mike Pence gonna have? on a girl from Withington born and bred in Britain. Like, oh sorry, you know, Doris from Withington, so, you know, she's protesting, you're gonna have to stand down, both you and Pence. Oh, Paul Ryan to be sworn in as president sooner afternoon. I find when people say marching is irrelevant, or, well, so-and-so from Doris from Withington. Doris from Withington has a voice and she has every single right to voice it. So is this conservative. <laughs> like, he sh she should be as equal as him to say that. And if that's how she wants to voice her opinion, then by all means do it. I mean, you know, those protests were going around the, on around the world, and I thought it was fantastic to see, you know, a global city like Manchester engaging with something, you know, like, you know, kind of, you know, something like that. You know, this is the city that, you know, of, of Pankhurst. And it's fantastic to see this um, kind of happening on the doorstep and connecting with, you know, other global and international cities on such an important issue. The media the grand megaphone that bellows both truth and lie. How did it affect your choice last time round? How will it affect your next vote? Yeah. But then of course this yeah, fake news, 
um, what is now the new trend word is quite dangerous and now even yeah, Trump uses this like every whatever he says is like these fake news he doesn't engage in a in a debate in a way like he just says everything is fake everything that is criticizes him is fake news rather than engaging in a political debate about what is the best for the country or society I mean that's that's what he serves the American people right and rather than engaging and maybe also with the opposition or so and trying to find best solutions in yeah in debating it's more like just this is fake this is fake fake news all fake it's a bit yeah, weak and, and, and simple and in the long term it's it's the wrong way I think I think with this day uh, this day and age everyone's pretty much aware but the question that we need to ask is what what are this, what are people doing about the information that they know so when it comes to things like voting we're sort of approaching our first ever mayoral election students know there's a mayoral election are they registered to vote are they going to vote do they think that it's something that they should take part in is it responsibility for them i think that's that's the question that we need to be asking and i think at the moment it's put essentially i don't i would say not to the level that i would personally like or well again that's my opinion and we don't read enough and i think reading is the foundation of everything when you look into a book you're, you're looking into someone else's mind because when you're typing it comes straight from your mind as well you know, and it, I think it's important that we do, like, for example, even if, if a lot of people, for example, read on the history that this country was built on, you know, like, for example, my grandfather, he was a First World War veteran, you know, but when you look at the education system and you open a history book, when you look at the veterans, they're all, they're all white men, you know, and they're called at a world war. There's not white people all over the world. It's, the world's mixed, you know, and the fact that, and the fact that those things, simple things are not shown within our history book, allows people to continue thinking narrow-mindedly about the history of this country and I think if people understood, understood how diverse this country was and the foundation, those foundations that it's built on, I don't think Brexit would have happened, it would have understood how like um, immigration and multiculturalism has benefited this country in the long term and at present as we speak. And you know when the news says you know the biggest hate crime or like hate crime has increased you know so much more in the past two years than it has in like the last 30 years, you kind of feel like um, it feels a bit unsettling and unsafe, um, so like we're trying our best to, you know, like tell people like it's not what the media says about us; it's like who we actually are. It's like a small, like representation. It's not even a representation of us. It's just like people using our name to like ruin our name. Young people are more influenced by these kind of yeah, social media short, catchy phrases entertaining phrases with Jerry Springer style in a way rather than like I mean okay politics is boring we have to like partly often it is boring it's very long and so but it maybe we should we shouldn't forget that it affects all of us that we are very much affected by it and we, we have to engage and we, ha we have to make the effort to engage rather than just believing what some people tell us in a funny entertaining way values what do you really care about and how does that affect the choices you make? I think one of the most important things for me um, is opportunity. <laughs> right now it shoots into my head, it's actually peace. Yeah? My pride and joy is sort of seeing a smile on my mum and dad's face, knowing that what you're doing is, is good, you're not doing anything as long as they're pleased, as long as the almighty is pleased, I'm pleased. I have spent you know, lots of time abroad, I have lots of friends as a consequence of my experience and opportunity from living and working in the European Union um, that has really made who I am. You know, when I got married, you know, we all joked that it was like a UN conference and it could have got funding from the European Commission. But that's, that's who I am, that's a representation of who I am and, uh, as a, and I am proud of those opportunities that I, uh, that I have had. Um, and I worry that those opportunities may not be there for future generations and that makes me really sad. It doesn't matter how much you are for this independent movement and sovereignty and so I think no one wants war. And we had a very, very stable period here in Europe, which is great. And, but yeah, we can't take this for granted. And history, like there has always been a big war. Uh, my grandparents always said that every generation will experience at least one war. This was, this was a common saying when my grandparents lived because it, it was the truth. And our parents, I think, are the first generation kind of which, which have never experienced the war. And hopefully they will not. But yeah, we can't take this for granted. So this peace and stability, and anyways, it's much nicer to travel, to, to meet people from different countries, to buddy up. Now we sit here, people from different 
countries talking to each other about these issues, I mean, that's much better than shooting at each other, isn't it? People often say that, in a democracy, decisions are made by a majority of the people. Of course, that is not true. Decisions are made by a majority of those who make themselves heard and who vote. A very different thing. Democracy is a massive thing. Democracy is, is, is what our country essentially is built on. It means that everyone has their sort of right to vote for their opinion and what they believe in. It means everything. It means everything. And I feel what I'm seeing and what I've experienced from last year with, with the Brexit vote, I feel like we're just closing down. But what uh, people seem to be doing is when a vote has taken place, they don't like that. They don't like that people have been democratic. They, they don't like that democracy has essentially taken place. Uh, and that is, and, and it's really poor. Because what it seems to be is that people are protesting after the event has happened, like it will somehow, people will magically change their position or, or influence somebody to change their position on it after it's already happened. People protest against Donald Trump after it happened. There weren't these mass protests in America against Donald Trump before the election. It happened to be after the election. It happened to be after he sworn in as well. You look at Brexit, like just what, about a couple of weeks to a month after uh, the vote, there was this huge, hundreds of thousands of people uh, protested uh, in attendance in, in, in London uh, for, for membership of the European Union. And where were these people before? I also sort of believe that something needs to change slightly, that people can only make, can only vote or have their voice if they're sort of well educated about the situation, so they're not making rash decisions based on media news or something they've heard from a friend. I think something needs to be done to sort of increase people's... Democracy is a brilliant thing. It gets people together. Look, I've won elections, I've lost elections. I move on and I, I keep fighting. Um, but I fight when I know there's going to be another election anyway. When it comes to local elections and it comes to general elections, you know there's going to be another vote soon. You know there's going to be another vote in the next couple of years or even a couple of months. So that's when you have the excuse to campaign and not on an issue that the whole country decides on. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's completely undemocratic, really. You know, just, I don't, I find it really worrying. And I can't speak for the university, I'm speaking for myself personally. I value democracy and I value working in a diverse department. We are a really diverse department. We have people from all over the world and I'd hate to see those people not being able to be here anymore. I'd hate us not to be able to welcome students to the university. I don't want us to see us closing doors and that's what worries me for the future. A silent generation. Although this film was approached with that bias, what's presented reflects the polarisation within the MMU campus. Now it's time for others to document their stories. We invite all UK student campuses to continue the narrative and document their experiences, to raise their voices and questions, to challenge change intelligently and write the history books themselves. Read more, listen more, Feel more and speak more. Vote. Vote today. Vote tomorrow. You cannot vote yesterday. The silent generation is beginning to play its symphony. Yeah, my hope for kind of the UK is that, you know, we're not living in a very united kingdom at present. You know, at this very present moment, we have no devolved administration or government or executive in Northern Ireland. We have Scotland that is banging on the door for a second independence referendum. And we are trying to negotiate one of the biggest negotiations and exit of an international organisation um, as a disunited kingdom. And I think my kind of hope for this is that we will unite as a united kingdom on this issue because this has been so divisive. I think we need something to happen again, a common goal to happen again. Um, I, I'm, my, my background is sport, so I can use a sport example, the Olympics. The 2012 Olympics, as soon as we won that bid, every single person in this country got behind GB. They got behind Team GB, they worked together, they promoted it inspired a generation was like the theme of it and you know politics is emotive 
but you also need to come together as well and, and accept the decision that is that we are leaving the European Union. Um, we need to be united in our decision, but we also need to take into account of that 48% that you know this was not what they wanted. Um, so we need to get the best deal for everybody. And I think going forward, uh, my hope would be that there will be an element of compromise um, on the part of both the EU but also the UK as well.